Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Two suspects are being one case involves the Disney FBI is now offering a hundred thousand dollars to see for police are releasing marathon. Welcome to Missy Mysteries. I'm your host Keely, and this is a paranormal and children podcast. This week's episode is gonna be a topic that I've never really covered before, but I feel like it'll be a nice way to come back after having COVID. As you can tell, my voice is a little bit still recovering, but we're going to push through it. I apologize for my voice. I feel like this topic is a bit more on the light side of true crime, but it was an interesting topic, which is an art heist known as the greatest art heist. Hello, I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. We're the husband and wife team behind the true crime podcast, and then they were gone. We're a weekly show that covers unsolved missing persons cases. These are cases that you, the listener, can have an impact on. That's right. Each week, we bring you a new case of someone who has gone missing and needs their story told. Some of the people you may have heard of, like Kristen Smart or Braceless Pisa. But we also bring you missing people of color and other cases that haven't gotten the mainstream attention that they deserve. We cover the missing person's life and delve into the investigation and media coverage. One thing that we've learned in the nearly two years of doing this podcast is that a lot of these cases could be solved if pressure was put on the investigative agencies to do more. Our hope is that by getting these stories out there, you'll help us put that pressure on them. So come along with us as we tell these stories, and maybe you hold the key to bringing someone home. And then they were gone as a proud member of the Darkcast Network and Spreaker Prime. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or your favorite podcast app. Let's jump right into this week's topic, which is the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum Art Heist. In the city of Boston, near Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts College of Art and Design, and Simmons University, sits the Isabella Gardner Museum. The museum is named after an art collector, Isabella Stewart Gardner. Isabella was born in New York on April 14, 1840. Two wealthy parents named David and Adelina Stewart. She grew up in the Manhattan area, where she learned dance, music, and art, as well as French and Italian language. And when Isabella was 16 in 1856, her and her family moved to Paris, where she went to school for American girls. Just a year living in Paris, she got the opportunity to travel to Milan, Italy, and got to see Gianni Pazillo's collection of Renaissance art, which is now in the art museum. When she saw his collection of art and how it was arranged by the different historical periods, she knew that one day she wanted to do the same to her own house and open it up for others to visit and enjoy her future collection of art. With a new dream of one day building an art collection like the one she had visited, she returned home to New York in 1858, where a girl from her school in Paris named Julia Gardner invited her to come to Boston with her, and this is where Isabel met Julia's brother, John Lowell Gardner, also known as Jack. Little did Julia know that Isabella and Jack would fall in love pretty quickly after meeting each other, and eventually her friend from school would become her sister-in-law. Isabella and Jack got married on April 10th, 1860, only four days before Isabella's 20th birthday, when Jack was 23 years old. The two of them got married in Grace Church, the church where Isabella had attended her whole life, and as a wedding present, the two were given a home on 152 Beacon Street in Boston. This is a home where the two had spent their whole life together, and Isabella spent some of her remaining years after Jack's passing. Isabella and Jack started their family just three years after getting married on June 18, 1863, when they welcomed their son John Low Gardner III into the world, but sadly at two years old, on March 15, 1865, he ended up passing away from a flu. Isabella, grieving her young son, started to struggle with her mental health, and she became very depressed, and her loved ones noticed a change in her and what she loved to do. In 1867, Isabella's doctors recommended the treatment of travel to help with her depression, and this is exactly what Jack and Isabella did. At the beginning of their trip, Isabella was having a very rough time 
But after a couple spent a year traveling Scandinavia, Russia, and Paris, Isabella was starting to feel better and wanted to return home to build something better. This trip was just to start a travel and memories for the two. In 1874, they traveled to the Middle East, Central Europe, and Paris. And when the two returned home from this trip, they sadly found out that Jack's brother had passed away. His brother left behind three young boys that Isabella and Jack then adopted and raised as their own until they were old enough to leave the home where Jack and Isabella started to then travel again in the 1880s. From the late 1880s to the 1890s, the couple traveled to many different countries, not really returning home to Boston for almost 10 years. During this time, Isabella began her collection of art after receiving an inheritance of $1.75 million from her father, which when I looked up in today's inflation would be roughly $55 million. She would buy mostly paintings and sculptures, but she would also buy photos, silver, tapestries, ceramics, and architectural art, such as doors, stained glass, and mantelpieces. She would fill her home with art, and eventually, even after expanding their home and donating to local museums, Jack and Isabella's home became too full of art to keep adding to the collection. It wasn't until two years after this realization, in December of 1898, after Jack passed away, that the museum came to be. After her husband's death, Isabella purchased the land where the museum sits today and hired architect William T. Sears. William dripped the plans and construction began in 1899. In the later months of 1901, construction finished on the four-story building and Isabella moved out of her home she shared with Jack to a private residency she built on the fourth floor so she could live with her collection and work on the exact layout she wanted for the museum. From the time she moved in in 1902, she kept the place closed till she finished with her design and opened the museum on January 1st, 1903. She opened the museum with a concert from the Boston Symphony Orchestra that was attended by scholars and philosophers. Over the next 20 years, she left the museum open for everyone to enjoy and learn from. She would host lectures, exhibits, performing arts during these 20 years. Then in 1919, Isabella suffered from a stroke and her house started to decline. She would still leave the museum open for visitors, but in 1924, she passed away in her residency on the fourth floor in the early years of her 80s. A lot can be said about Isabella. She is a woman who has many, many stories told about her, from raising her nephews, fighting for gay rights, pushing the boundaries of society, and her stories of travel. She is definitely worth learning more about, but this is a true crime podcast. So, when Isabella passed away, she left an endowment to leave the museum open as long as nothing would be taken from her collection or changed. She wanted the fourth floor left a residency so the next museum director could live there to protect the art, but understandably, the next director had a home and family, which made them decide to use Isabella's residency as an office instead. The fourth floor remains an office, but the museum is not left vulnerable. There are overnight guards and a security system. Although on March 18, 1990, this did not seem to be enough when the museum fell victim to what some call the greatest art heist. At 7.30 a.m., the new guards came into work to switch out the overnight guards, but they noticed that the men were not answering the door to buzz them in for their shift. They felt too much time had passed and called this into the director of security, who immediately drove into work to see what was happening. The director of security took the new guards into the building through a back door that they had never been through before, and they knew something was wrong. The cameras were turned away, and the office door had been busted open. Inside the office was an empty painting frame on the chair of the directors, and sitting against the wall was a crowbar. The director got on the phone to the Boston police and told them he was with the museum and that there was big trouble. Very quickly, everyone was called in, and the streets filled with police cars. The police came into the museum and cleared floor by floor before getting to the basement. In the basement, they found two night guards, 
Richard Abath and Randy Headstead, who was actually working his first night shift covering for another guard. The men had been handcuffed and tied up with duct tape. Richard, also known as Rick, was tied up in a very odd way. Rick had very long, curly hair. His hair had been wrapped around his eyes, and his head was then duct taped. The police took pictures of tied up Rick that can be seen and shown in many articles and documentaries about the crime. Rick and Randy were both unarmed. Rick even went to a Grateful Dead show the next day in Hartford, Connecticut, where he partied for two days before coming home to Boston, although the same could not be said for the museum's art collection. Thirteen pieces of art had been stolen from the museum. Eleven paintings and etchings had been cut out, leaving the golden frames all over the rooms. Some of these pieces of art are still great losses to the art community, but for the thieves, they may have gotten away with $500 million worth of art. People today are still investigating and asking how this happened, but let's go over what we know. At 12 a.m., Rick started his first rounds of the museum, and he encountered one of the first strange things to happen that night. Around 12.45 a.m., while he was on his rounds, the fire alarm started to go off. In the documentary, This is a Robbery, on Netflix, the director of the museum, when the robberies happened, and multiple security guards mentioned that there were issues with the wiring and work needed to be done on the building, so the fire alarm would go off and they would just dismiss it, just like Rick did this night. Around the same time, two eyewitnesses out drinking for St. Patrick's Day saw what they believed to be two Boston police officers sitting in a Dodge Daytona outside the museum. At 1 a.m., Rick relieved Randy from his position at the guard desk, and Rick noticed that there were two police officers on the camera outside the museum, and at 1.24 a.m., the men came up to the door, and they told Rick they were Boston police, responding to a report of disturbance on the premises. Rick buzzed the two men in, and they asked Rick if he was alone, and when he told them, no, my partner is doing rounds, they told Rick to call him down to the desk. At this point, one of the cops starts to ask Rick if he knows him, and he says, don't I know you? Don't I recognize you? I think there's a warrant out for your arrest. Can you step away from the desk? Rick then leaves the desk, leaving his only access to the museum's police call button. And at 1.48 a.m., about 20 minutes, since the men entered the first door, they gained access to the second door. One of the men asked Rick to stand against the wall. The two men were handcuffed and then told them one of the most famous lines of this house. Gentlemen, this is a robbery. Randy and Rick were taken to the basement, where they would later be found at 8 a.m., and for the next 81 minutes, the two men robbed the Garner Museum. The thieves started in the Dutch room, where they took three pieces of Rembrandt's art pieces, the Christ in the Storm of the Sea of Galilee, a lady and gentleman in black, and a self-portrait etching that was about the size of a post-it note, a Vermeer painting called The Concert, a flick painting called the landscape of obliques and an ancient chinese bronze goo was taken from a table they then went to the short gallery on the same floor as the dutch room taking five degus drawings and a bronze eagle finnel from a flag on the first floor in the blue room the minute painting was taken and its frame was the one found on the chair in the guards room the thieves then took two trips to their car, and before leaving, they took the VHS tape with the video of the time that they were in the museum and took a piece of paper from a printer that would print out all the motion detected on the museum's sensors and left the museum at 2.45 a.m. with $500 million worth of art. Following the robbery, sketches and descriptions were released of the suspects, the first one was described as a white male in his early 30s, 5 foot 10, and about 160 pounds with dark hair. He was wearing gold-wired glasses, and he had a mustache that Rick described as greasy and possibly fake. The second suspect was described as a white male in his early 30s, 6 foot tall, dark hair, and a mustache. Boston police were first to arrive on scene, but FBI took over the investigation from day one. The evidence collection is not what it is today. For one example, the tape from the guards was never collected or tested, 
which it would have been today. The tape was essentially crumpled up and left on the floor, later to be cleaned up, and not much evidence in general was found. Outside of the motion detected, that was likely backed up on a hard drive in the printer. And the, the actions of the robbers, however, did leave people asking if this could have been an inside job. Some even believing that Rick may have played a part in it all these years later. And this is because whoever robbed the place had the knowledge of where the VHS tapes with the video footage would be, that there was only one button to call for help, where the paper was printed out with the motion sensors, and that there was a hidden door in the Dutch room that they had opened. The motivation for this robbery is speculated by many, many people, but it is generally agreed that these art pieces are way too hot to be sold, and maybe the thieves really didn't know this when they stole the art, but by the time they knew this, they already had it. Some of the most popular theories of why this happened or the motive of it is that the thieves were hired by a private collector to get these specific pieces, or because of how expensive and sought out the art was at the time, people connected to organized crime stole the art to use as a leverage to make deals when in trouble with other crimes, but also art was stolen because people would use it as down payments for large cocaine shipments. There's been a number of suspects and people investigated in the Gardner Art Heist. Most recently, investigators have shared they believe a Boston Mafia organization known as the Merlono Gang is responsible. It's believed in 2002 that if they are responsible, the art was moved to Connecticut or Pennsylvania. Investigators believe that the thieves are most likely George Russenfelder, whose sister-in-law believes she helped him hang up one of the stolen pieces above his bed, though it was never found. And Leonard de Musso, both of these men passed away shortly after the heist in 1991. Leonard was murdered and later found in the trunk of an abandoned car, and George died of a cocaine overdose in his apartment. Two men, Robert Guarantee and Robert Genley, were also investigated for possibly having possession of the painting, but when their homes were searched, no signs of them were found. Guarantee passed away in 2009, and Gently passed away in 2021 at the age of 85. And the last man who could have connections to the crime from this group was recently released from prison for unrelated crimes. The docuseries This is a Robbery, the Greatest Art Heist on Netflix goes into great detail on these men and the evidence possibly found against them. But for now, the art heist is still unsolved after 32 years. The Isabella Gardner Museum, in respects for Isabella, has not replaced the art since she never wanted her collection changed. Instead, they leave the empty frames on the wall in hopes that the art will return home one day. For now, the art community and employees of the museum hope that whoever committed these crimes, their belongings get passed down to their grandkids or their kids, and that these kids will return the art, hoping that the $10 million reward would be of motivation. For now, I want to thank you for listening. I know my voice is very rough in this episode, so I apologize and I thank you for sticking around. If you liked this episode, please leave a good review or feedback. I would love to do more unsolved art heists or just a little more easygoing, so I'd love to know how you feel about it, if you would like more. And for me, I know it was a nice turn back from COVID. Please stay safe out there, stay hydrated, and I will see you next week.